In our previous video, we discussed how we can describe an object's motion from its location, position, to how far it's moved, distance and displacement, how quickly it's moving, speed and velocity, and how quickly it's changing its motion, acceleration. We represented motion through our use of language, but as physicists, we also express motion through graphs. Let's start with the representation we're already familiar with, strobe photographs. This is a fox trotting along at a constant speed. With its position recorded at regular intervals of time, we can see that the fox covers the same distance every time. This is a fox that steadily gains speed from rest. Each position marker is placed further and further apart to show more distance covered each time. This is a fox that's running at first, then steadily slows down. Each position marker is placed at decreasing distances. In these strobe photograph diagrams, we've been labeling the fox's position at different times. We can translate this into a graph of the fox's motion by separating our labels. Since the fox's position is dependent upon how much time the fox spends moving, we can place the fox's position on the vertical y-axis and time on the horizontal x-axis. Each of these position markers is taken at a different time, so we'll have to place these positions with the times they're associated with. The first position marker is associated with their start of the timeline, T0. The next position marker is associated with T1, so let's slide that over to T1. The next position marker is associated with T2, so let's get that in the right spot and keep going. The fox's next position is T3, and final position is at T4. What do these points form on each position time graph? Well. For the constant speed graph, we see the points form a line. For the accelerating graphs, we see the points form curves. Let's look more closely at the constant speed graph which shows a line. You might remember from math class that a line, by definition, has constant slope. If we look at the fox's change in position or displacement on the y-axis in each time interval on the x-axis, we see that the fox covers the same displacement every time. This is what it means for the fox to travel at constant speed. That's different from the accelerating fox's graph. A curve, by definition, has changing slope. How are these slopes changing, though? Well, looking at the graph of the fox gaining speed, notice how the slope gets steeper as time goes on and as the fox gets faster. And looking at the graph of the fox losing speed, notice how the slope gets flatter as time goes on as the fox gets slower. The magnitude or size of slope of this position time graph therefore tells us the velocity of the fox. That makes sense. Slope is defined as the change in y divided by the change in x. A greater change in y for the same change in x would lead to a greater slope. In this case, when the fox is gaining speed, the y values changing represent the position changing while the x values changing represent time passing. So, a greater change in position for the same interval of time would lead to a faster object. Nice, let's put that to work on our constant speed graph. If the fox were moving faster, it had cover more distance by t4, and so its ending position would be higher. Since it still reaches t4 at a constant pace, we would connect these two points with a line. Likewise, if the fox were moving more slowly, it would have covered less distance by t4. The start and end would be connected again with a flatter line to represent this constant, slower speed. Even more so, we can imagine that a fox that's not moving at all will end up making no change to its position as time continues, resulting in a flat line with zero slope. So really, these descriptions of steepness are all descriptions of slope. And these descriptions of slope on a position time graph indicates the object's velocity. Dang, that's a lot about slope. So let's make sure we're all on the same page when we describe slope. When we describe the magnitude or size of slope, we're describing the steepness of the slope. We can always determine the magnitude of the slope by calculating the change in y value between two points divided by the change in x values between those two same points or rise over run. The magnitude can remain constant, and in this case, our graph would appear as a line. If that magnitude changes, our graph would appear as a curve. 
A curve that gets steeper indicates the magnitude of slope increasing, and a curve that gets flatter indicates the magnitude of the slope decreasing. Wait, can't slopes have sign? What's the difference between this positively sloped line and this negatively sloped line? Let's go back to the constant speed fox. If the fox were to move backwards, its change in position would be negative. So, if the fox started here at the origin, it would end up here in the negative region of the graph. Since it's still moving at constant velocity, the slope here would be constant too, and we'd be able to connect these two points with the line. The negatively sloped line means the fox is moving backwards. Same thing with our accelerating graphs. If it's moving backwards, its ending position would be behind its starting position. We know that we'd have to start with the flatter slope and end with the steeper slope to show the fox speeding up, and exactly the opposite for the fox slowing down. We would just need to make these slopes negative to show the direction the fox is moving. So there it is. The sign of the slope of a position time graph indicates direction of velocity. Wait, do the position values have to be negative for the fox to move backwards? Not at all. Our starting position doesn't have to be at the origin of the graph. Since position is relative, we can move the zero position around and the motion would be the same. When the slope is negative, the object is moving backwards regardless of where it is on the position axis. Okay, let's recap what we know about position time graphs. Slope indicates velocity. Velocity, a vector, has magnitude and direction. And so, the magnitude of slope, known as the steepness, indicates the magnitude of velocity, known as how fast. If the magnitude of the slope and velocity remains constant, we graph a line. If the magnitude of slope and velocity changes by increasing or decreasing, we get a graph of a curve. The sign of the slope indicates the direction of the velocity. If the sign is positive, the velocity is in the positive direction. If the sign is negative, the velocity is in the negative direction. Be careful! Positive slope and increasing slope do not mean the same thing. Likewise, negative slope and decreasing slope do not mean the same thing. For a position time graph, the sign indicates direction, while increasing and decreasing indicates some form of acceleration. Great! While we've been graphing position versus time, we've been talking a lot about an object's velocity. So let's plot velocity as a function of time. On the y-axis, we have velocity, and on the x-axis, we have time. Let's translate these position time graphs into velocity time graphs. Our fox is moving in the positive direction at a constant speed. The position time graph shows a positive slope indicating a positive velocity. So we know we'll be plotting our graph in the positive region of the velocity time graph. The slope of the position time graph is also constant, which means our velocity value would remain constant the whole time. Similarly, if the fox is moving backwards at constant speed, the position time graph shows a negative slope and our velocity values will be negative. And since the position time graph also shows a constant slope, our velocity values won't change. Let's look at our fox gaining speed. If the fox is gaining speed in the positive direction, our position time graph shows a positive slope. So, our velocity values will be in the positive region of the graph. Since the slope of the position time graph is increasing as the fox gains speed, our velocity values should grow in magnitude away from the x-axis. Similarly, if the fox were moving in the negative direction gaining speed, the position time graph shows negative increasing slope. So the velocity time graph should start in the negative region and grow in value away from the x axis. The zero on the y axis represents a velocity and speed of zero. That means the closer our values are to the x axis, the slower the object. And the further our values are from the x axis, the faster the object, regardless of whether we're above or below the x-axis, because positive and negative values for velocity only indicate direction. Finally, let's check out our fox slowing down. When the fox slows down in the positive direction, the position time graph shows a positive decreasing slope. 
So, the velocity time graph should start in the positive region and decrease in volume towards the x-axis. If the fox is moving in the negative direction as it slows down, the position time graph shows a negative decreasing slope. So, the velocity time graph would start in the negative region and decrease in volume towards the x-axis. Are we seeing the pattern here? The slope of the position time graph becomes the values of the velocity time graph. So, what does the slope of a velocity time graph tell us? Let's analyze slope. Change in y divided by change in x. For this velocity time graph, the change in y is the change in velocity, and the change in x is the change in time. The change in velocity divided by change in time is, well, that's acceleration. That makes sense. When the fox was moving at constant speed, regardless of what speed, the slope was zero. A zero slope means there's no change in the y values, even though there's a change in the x values. In this case, there's no change in velocity even when there's a change in time. In other words, there's no acceleration. And for our accelerating fox, regardless of the actual velocity values, if the fox were to change its velocity more in the same amount of time, it would end up with a steeper slope and a greater acceleration. Additionally, if the fox were to change its velocity less in the same amount of time, it would end up with a flatter slope and a smaller acceleration. We can comparatively see the size of acceleration by looking at the steepness of the slope. What about the direction of acceleration? Well, let's look at our fox gaining speed. When the fox has positive velocity, the slope is positive, indicating a positive acceleration. And when the fox has negative velocity, the slope is negative, indicating a negative acceleration. That makes sense, because to gain speed, the velocity and the acceleration must be in the same direction. Likewise, when the fox has positive velocity, the slope is negative, indicating a negative acceleration. And when the fox has negative velocity, the slope is positive, indicating a positive acceleration. Excellent! To slow down, an object's velocity and acceleration have to be in opposite directions. You may have noticed that our examples show a constantly changing velocity. That's because most of our work will involve uniformly accelerated motion. Okay, let's recap what we know so far. Slope of a position time graph is velocity. Slope of a velocity time graph is acceleration. Can we make an acceleration time graph? Well, certainly. Let's translate our velocity time graphs into acceleration time graphs. In all cases, constant velocity motion the acceleration will be zero throughout. When the fox gains speed in the positive direction, the slope of the velocity time graph is positive, telling us that our acceleration should be in the positive region of the acceleration time graph. Since the slope of the velocity time graph is also constant, we know our acceleration will stay the same value the whole time. When the fox gains speed in the negative direction, the slope of the velocity time graph is negative, and so our acceleration should be in the negative region of the acceleration time graph. The slope of the velocity time graph is also constant, and so we know our acceleration should remain constant the whole time. Are you seeing the pattern? When the fox is losing speed in the positive direction, the slope of the velocity time graph is negative and constant. So our acceleration is in the negative region of the graph and constant the whole time. Finally, when the fox is losing speed in the negative direction, the slope of the velocity time graph is positive and constant, and so our acceleration is in the positive region of the graph and constant the whole time. Notice, two of our graphs with positive accelerations are for two different states of motion. One came from an object gaining speed, and the other losing speed. Our acceleration time graphs alone provide us with the least specific information about an object's state of motion. Awesome, the slope of the acceleration time graph mean anything? Yeah, it actually shows us how quickly acceleration is changing. We call this jerk, the change in acceleration divided by time. But we won't be going into further details about jerk here, since we're focusing on constant acceleration situations. So we form these three motion graphs showing position, velocity, 
and acceleration as a function of time. We've analyzed their slope and found that slope doesn't just have a value, but has meaning for each graph. There's one more thing we can analyze, and that's the area under the curve, or line. Essentially, the area under the curve, or line, is the space between the curve and the x-axis. This area could be above the x-axis, positive, or below the x-axis, negative. Let's look at an acceleration time graph. What's the difference between these two acceleration values? Well, in the first graph, the acceleration values are smaller. That means the change in velocities are smaller. And if we were to calculate the area underneath this line, we'd notice it's smaller as well. We can always calculate the area of that shape using some of your geometry. For a rectangle, the area is equal to the base times height. Notice the base is your x-axis and your height is your y-axis. When it comes to calculating the area of any shape, really, we need to multiply the two dimensions, x and y. In this case, our base on our x-axis is time and our height on our y-axis is acceleration. So our area comes out to acceleration times time. Wait, that looks sort of familiar. If we take the equation acceleration equals change in velocity divided by time and rearrange it so time is on the other side, we get acceleration times time equals change in velocity. So the area of the acceleration time graph is the object's change in velocity. Neat! Let's try this for the velocity time graph. In the first graph, the velocity values are smaller. That would mean the object would cover less displacement. Looking at the graph, we also notice the area under the line is smaller. Let's confirm this like we did earlier by calculating the area of this triangle. Area equals one half times base times height. We can still see that the area depends on multiplying the base, which is our time on the x-axis, with the height, which is our velocity on the y-axis. Our area means velocity times time. Hmm. If we have the equation velocity equals displacement divided by time, rearranging it, we would get velocity times time equals displacement. The area for a velocity time graph is displacement. Dang, we're on a roll. All right, one more. Let's try this for the position time graph. The area would be our y-axis times our x-axis. That would be position times time. Hmm. We don't really have an equation for that. Well, that's all right. We can always calculate an area for a graph, but it doesn't always mean anything useful to us. In this case, the area of a position time graph isn't significant to us at all. Well, there you have it. We covered how to represent motion graphically through position time graphs, velocity time graphs, and acceleration time graphs. We found that the slope of a position time graph gives us the values of velocity. And the slope of a velocity time graph gives us the values of acceleration. Going in the opposite direction, we also found that the area underneath the acceleration time curve gives us the object's total change in velocity. And the area underneath the velocity time curve gives us the object's overall change in position, also known as displacement. By now you should have a good understanding of what these graphs can show us about an object's motion through the values plotted on each graph and the analysis of their slopes and areas. I look forward to our next lesson where we continue on to predicting motion. See you later on Penguin Physics.